Alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulullah, ma ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Thank you very much everyone for coming. Um, I hope inshallah we'll learn something from each other. But before I will start, I have been told to not to joke. Where is, yeah, to not to joke? Okay. Um, can I smile? Uh, okay, so serious face, yeah? Yeah, so it's like that. Okay, so what are we going to learn about the biography? You know, the issue related to the biography is quite important. Unfortunately, in our time, the students somehow disconnected from the biography of the scholars. I think it is the Western way of learning. Do you understand? Um, um, I do assume that most of the people who are here, they are born in the West. Am I right? So most likely you will not have the taste of Eastern way of learning. You know, the information, uh, unfortunately, um, in the West, it's mainly based on the experimental way. Am I right? They experiment. So there is opinion, they experimented. Okay, scientific way, empirical way, etc. And then they either implemented in the practice or either they rejected if it's not proven. Okay, but... How are you going to do with the theological opinions? Can you experiment them? You cannot. Okay. So, but what you can do is you can evaluate the level of the author based on that. So the level of the author. So that may give some type of weight. So that's why we in Eastern way of learning, we give high importance to the biography of the scholars because that will give us good understanding of the opinions okay i'm going to give you an example okay so which you may not find in the western way of learning for example do you know my question to you guys if you can just help me please if you see someone doing wrong thing is it your duty as a believer to explain what is right to do or not it's my question to you did anyone understand? By the way, I'm speaking in English right now. I've been speaking in English since I came, you know. <laughs> ah, sorry. I should not be smiling, yeah? I've been speaking in English since I came. Yeah? Yeah. Look, if you see me doing something wrong, for example, I'm backbiting someone. You as a believer, should you explain that it is wrong to do or not? Yes. It is one of the fundamentals of Islam. When you see evil, you should do your best to stop that evil. Okay. Now, um, maybe you don't know about this person. His name is Said ibn Jubair, one of the top students of Sahaba companions. He said, Said ibn Jubair said, stopping the evil, not permissible. If you see someone doing evil, you should not stop him in one. Place. And in the other place, he says, it's not necessary, it's not compulsory to stop the evil. Now, how to understand? So, we will understand it after looking into his biography. Do you remember this uh, general general of Bani Umayyah called Hajjaj? Who knows this person, Hajjaj? Hajjaj, he is um, very well known for oppression. He used to, he has killed so many of the companions. So Said bin Jubair used to live in his time. And Hajjaj was looking after him. So he was chasing him. And Said bin Jubair used to run away from one place to another just to save his life. So during that time, he said, stopping the evil is not necessary. So after looking into his biography, we understand the context of his opinion. So we say his opinion is limited within some certain circumstance in which Said ibn Jubair used to live. Doesn't make sense. Yeah. So that is, you can say, just one aspect uh, or one point which may explain the importance of looking into the biography of the scholars. Okay, so uh, that is one of those things. Just uh, my question to you guys. Why did you come here today? What do you want to learn from the biography of Abu Hanifa?
I want to, I came here to learn because he's also from Uzbekistan and I'm also from Uzbekistan. So that's why I came or else I wouldn't come, you know. Next week, the, it will be the biography of Imam Malik. Malik, yes. This Saudi guy, Imam Malik. Shafi. Uh, so he's Palestinian guy. I'm not coming. <laughs> I came here because Abu Hanifa, his father is from Termez, Uzbekistan. Okay, so, or else I wouldn't come. So why did you come for the biography? What do you want to learn? Okay, Sayyidi. <clears throat> so it will help us learning. The biography of Abu Hanifa will help us to understand the mindset of, you can say, one quarter of Muslim world. Because one quarter of Muslim world, they follow this person called Imam Adam, Abu Hanifa. Okay. Or I would say it is a bit, uh, could be more. Okay. Because, um, we have Shia and then Sunnah. And the vast majority of the Sunnah, they follow the uh, Hanafi school of thought. Okay. So it includes, it includes most of the, um, uh, uh, most of the Asian countries. Okay. Central Asia as well as Pakistan, India. And um, and also it is in Egypt also second largest uh, school also so Hanafi school is the the most spread in the uh, Sunni world so it will help us to understand the mindset of these people by learning the biography of their Imam. Do I have any Hanafis here? Everyone is Hanafi. Yeah 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 he he's not he's not yeah yeah okay okay um okay do I have Shafis? Okay, two Shafis. I'm not coming next week, so you guys can come and discuss the biography of your Imam, okay? Do I have Malikis? Oh, ma ma mashallah, good. Um, uh, w which country, sorry? Oh, you follow Ma- Yeah, because Morocco. Ah, okay, okay. I, I used to think because this uh, Bukhari, I thought that it's Hanafis. Nigerians are Hanafis. No? Malikis. So why your president is Bukhari then? Call him Malik or something, you know. <laughs> We're not giving you permission to steal our names, you know. <laughs> we are Hanafis. Okay, do we have Hanbalis? I'm sorry, I cannot stop it. You know, joke should go, you know. It's too, too difficult to stop it, you know. It's just going out. <laughs> okay, say Um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, the birth of, the, the date of birth of Abu Hanifa, we do not have unanimous opinion about that. Okay, so it is, it starts, the opinions will, will start between the year 51 up to 83. Okay, so these are the opinions. Okay, and the majority of the scholars, they follow the opinion which say that it is the year 61st of Hijrah. Okay, which means that after 40 years of the death of Rasulullah salatu wasalam. Okay, or less than 40 years. But the most popular opinion say that it is the year uh, 80th. Okay, so that will be something about year 700, okay, AD. Okay, so that is the most popular opinion. Um, uh, so, and then uh, originally he is Persian, that is agreed upon. But where is he originally from? Again, we do not have any unanimous opinion. Okay, so uh, most likely he is... Persian from Afghanistan. Do I have Afghani people here today? None. Yeah. So if they would know that Abu Hanif is from Afghanistan, they would come also. So uh, Afghanistan from Kabul. His father is from Kabul. When Muslims invaded into Afghanistan, okay, so they have been enslaved. Okay, so actually Abu Hanif belongs to the royal family of that place, Kabul. So either he is from Kabul or Termez. Termez is in uh, current Uzbekistan. <clears throat> so anyway, so when Muslims invaded into one of these two countries, so they have enslaved. They have enslaved. So most likely the um, uh, father of Abu Hanifa, he was maybe the, he, he was leading one of the uh, one of the groups army against the invaders. Um, so then uh, they lost most likely. So he has been enslaved. Okay, and again, it, it could be one of those uh, not reliable stories because we have another story in which uh, it was the one who was enslaved, it was his grandfather and not the father. 
Okay, and his, when his father was born, uh, his grandfather brought him to Imam Ali for blessing. Okay, so uh, Imam Ali made blessing for uh, Thabit, the father of Abu Hanifa. Okay, so then uh, our Mashaikh say that it is the barakah of Imam Ali. Abu Hanifa is just barakah of Imam Ali. And when you go to look into his opinions, you find quite a lot of, uh, you can say, agreement between um, uh, Abu Hanifa and the Imams who are descending from Ali, mainly Imam Zaid or Abdullah al mahd Okay, so in opinion, they agree in many places. Okay, so for example, uh, do you know, um, in terms of, uh, because they told me to not to mention the controversial issues, so I have to mention one. So do you know, for example, killing the apostate? Okay, there are two, two uh, scholars who do not believe in it. Guess who are these two scholars? Because they said, don't mention uh, controversial, so I'm mentioning. So it is Imam Zaid and Abu Hanifa. They say there is no punishment for that. Do you understand? So it is very consistent to one another. Okay, so somehow they're agreeing in many places with one another. Okay, or for example, another controversial issue. Do you know when you sleep, do you break your wudu? Our Maliki brothers say yes. Shafi brothers say yes. Hanafis, Abu Hanifa and Imam Zaid say no. Do you understand? So uh, somehow there is this consistency. So our Mashaikh say, our Mashaikh say that it is the barakah of Imam Ali. So somehow because of that, because of that, they are according. Okay, so they are according one uh, with another. I'm quite confident that it's about not joking, yeah? Or about not smiling. Okay, so I will not smile anymore. Okay, I will only laugh. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, it could be that also. Okay. So one thing we can make to uh, we can make one conclusion that there is no any clear there is no any clear information about the background of Imam uh, Abu Hanifa. Okay. So is he from Uzbekistan or is he from Kabul? We don't know when exactly he was born. We don't know. Who is the person who was enslaved? Is it his father or grandfather? Again, we don't know. Okay, so that is uh, one of those things. Okay, but now uh, forget about the controversial issues. You guys told me to mention two, so I mentioned two only. So there will not be any more. Okay, yes. <clears throat> um, uh, Abu Hanifa started studying from very young age. Okay, and the reason for that was uh, he, him, and his father. They used to be merchants. They had um, a shop. They used to sell fabric. Okay, so he, uh, do you know this uh, silk, silk fabric? Uh, I don't think in our time we sell the natural silk, isn't it? It's mainly synthetic. Yeah, it's quite uh, expensive to produce it. So they used to sell the uh, silk fabric. Okay, and then a lady came. Lady came and uh, 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 the lady wanted to know about something uh, to do with wudu and namaz. So she came. Most likely it was the time in which the father of Abu Hanifa was not there. And according to the narrations, his father died in his young age, when he was young. Okay, so anyway, so when lady came, there was no anyone except Abu Hanifa in the shop. Then she said, I want you to go to the mosque and there is this scholar, Faqih, Shabi, actually. Shabi, one of the top scholars of Kufa in that time. Go and ask him about X, Y, Z issues related to the wudu. I want to know. And I will be waiting here, looking after your shop. So Abu Hanifa, he was young in that time. So in my own understanding, it will be something between the age of 12 up to the age of I would say 16, within that age. Okay. So, and then, um, uh, so Abu Hanifa went to Shabi and uh, he asked him. So after, so when, uh, uh, when he came, so Abu Hanifa was posing the question on the way, Shabi straight away understood that this is potential scholar. Do you know, sometimes you have conversation with the people, straight away you understand the mindset of the person. So straight away you can uh, say that this person has artistic mindset. Okay, or you say this person has philosophical mindset. Or 
you say this person has schizophrenic mindset, like inconsistent way of thinking. Do you understand? So based on that, you know what is the, the best way, best subject for him to study. Okay. So what, which faculty do you guys study? Is it controversial also? No, not really. Okay. Is it uh, humanitarian or is it uh, sciences or, or is it just mixed? Mixed. Um, um, do you guys actually believe that you chose your own way? Because we're a lazy creation, we're a lazy creature. So let's suppose that if I am um, um, uh, in intellectual, so if I will go for the physical training, I will not succeed in that because that's not my habit, that's not my way. And we are lazy, do you understand? So lazy person should choose something which he enjoys. So then you can progress in that. Do you understand? So anyway, this kid came to Shabi. His name is Nu'aman. Okay, so he says, Imam of Faqih, this lady is asking me X, Y, Z. Shabi was so deeply impressed. Deeply impressed. Because kid posing the question on the way as if he was in the field for a long time. Okay, so when he went back, he went back to the lady and explained. He gave the answer. After that, in the story, it says Shabi went behind him. So after going, so after seeing him, there was conversation. I don't know. It's not written. What was the conversation about? Shabi said, um, "Do you study somewhere? Do you study? Do you learn from anyone?" So Abu Numan, uh, Abu Hanifa, in that time said, "No, I just sit here. I sell. I'm merchant." Okay. So then he said. Uh, go and start learning. In that time, Ibrahim al nakhai this person, this scholar, was famous to teach. Shabi was as a mufti, known as a mufti, but Ibrahim al nakhai was known as teaching, as a teacher. So he said, go and learn from that person because he is your way. So Ibrahim al nakhai had exactly the same mindset. Okay, and then he said, you are going to be great scholar in your future, insha'Allah. That was the just prediction. Okay, so if you remember uh, about Imam Shafi, rahimahullah, who made that prediction about being great scholar? It was Imam Malik. Okay, so first when he came, when Shafi came as a child to Malik, so he said, Ittaqillah fa inna laka sha'anan, you Arabian. So do you understand what I said? Okay. Ittaqillah. Okay. Take care of yourself. Fa'inna laka sha'anan. Because in the future you are going to get glorious future. That was the prediction of Malik about Shafi. And Shabi made similar prediction about this child, Abu Hanifa. Then Abu Hanifa says, since then I started learning from Ibrahim and Nakhai. Okay. So that was the beginning. You know? Abu Hanifa was lucky, Shafi was lucky. So, um, I wish if each of us would be lucky. Because in the childhood, if we, if we fall on the right track, each of us, we can make just glorious future for ourselves. Okay. But unfortunately, most of us, our talent will be hidden until we become mature by ourselves. And then sometimes we discover our Talent, but most of the time it will just die with us. And talent, it does not have to be. It's not all the time that you have to be theologian, philosopher. It, your talent could be merchant. Do you understand? Or your talent could be boxer. Do you understand? But it is good to find your own talent in the right time because then you can work on it. So improving your talent, it, it's not the part-time job, but it is full-time job. Requires starting from the childhood. Okay, so if you started from that, so look for example at these two examples, Shafi and Abu Hanifa. Because their talents were discovered by the right people in the right time, now we have masses of people following their opinions. Yeah? Now, uh, put your hand up if anyone made prediction about you guys. I will make one prediction. After the lecture, you, all of you guys are going to go to eat something. That's my prediction. So far, 
I, I never made any mistake about making predictions. Yeah, so did you get anything from your father or mother, for example? Most of the time, our mothers can feel us. They know what we are. And most of the time, we are disobedient. We do not listen to what our mothers say about which direction to go. That is not, that is not right. So anyway, then what happened? So Abu Hanifa started uh, studying different subjects, okay, from Ibrahim and Nakhai. It came, it came to the point that, um, <clears throat> Uh, Abu Hanifa perfected, perfected uh, the school of Ahl al-Kufa, okay, through Ibrahim and Nakhay. And Ibrahim and Nakhay, he is the narrator of two top scholars of Sahaba. Who knows who are these two top scholars? Just give, give me any guess. First of them, excellent. And the second is, so if it is Ibn Mas'ud, so then who will be the next? Marshall, it is Umar ibn al-Khattab. Ibn Umar is the narrator of Umar. I do believe that Ibn Mas'ud narrated the knowledge of Umar radiallahu anhu much more better than Ibn Umar. So these two scholars, Ibrahim al nakhai is the narrator of the fiqh of two scholars, Umar ibn al-Khattab and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu majma'in. Okay, so anyway, um, so he became the expert of the knowledge of Kufa. And most of our top scholars, they have a period in their life in which after perfecting the knowledge of their area, they travel. Without traveling, without comparing what you have got to the knowledge of the other people, you never become unique, you never become reliable, you never become authentic. Okay, so you will be as that narrow-minded person. If you understand what I'm trying to say. So even Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَتَكُونَ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا Okay, means why they would not travel in the world in order to obtain the brains that think. Do you understand? So, so it's impossible for you to have solid, authentic knowledge without Obtaining the knowledge of your area and then going out and comparing what other people have and comparing which one is reliable and sorting out the information which you have got from your area. And without exemption, without exemption, the scholars of imams of four madhahib of Ahl Sunnah, they went through this process except one. Who is this person? Yes. I'm going to joke now. Yes. Imam Ahmad traveled a lot. Who said Imam Ahmad? Are you Hanafi? <laughs> so, <laughs> because you are Malik, that's why you said, you know, it's actually Imam Malik. Imam Malik left Medina only once. Why did he leave Medina only once? Sorry? No, 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 of course, that was the reason for him to stay in Medina. But where did he go when he left Medina once? Hajj. And everyone else, they traveled a lot. For example, Imam Shafi'i, where is he from originally? He's from Palestine, from Khalil. And then all of a sudden, he comes to Malik, Medina. And then he comes to Imam Muhammad, Iraq. Okay. And all of a sudden, he comes to Egypt. Where is his grave right now? In Egypt. Yes. And same thing about Ahmad. Okay, so originally his father is from Maru. Maru is Turkmenistan, just on the border of Afghanistan. But he was born in Baghdad, but he travels to Yemen, to everywhere. Okay, and same thing with Abu Hanifa. Okay, so after, uh, after completing his studies within his area, then he traveled. Then he went to Hijaz. Okay, so if you look into the list of his teachers, you find the teachers, uh, Hijazi teachers. Hijaz means Mecca and Medina. Okay, and Shami teachers. Sham means Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, all of these areas. And you find te- uh, amongst his teachers from all over the Muslim world. Okay, so that how, that how. And um, we have within Hanafi school, we have sometimes 
uh, opinions of Abu Hanifa, we have more than one opinion of Abu Hanifa. And that is, this is one of the reasons, sometimes, okay, after going and traveling, he changed his opinion. So we do have, not a lot, but some of his opinions will have contradiction between his opinions because of that. So after traveling, he finds out that his first position was weaker. So he leaves this, uh, the, the earliest position, and then he, go, he goes for the new position. Okay, so that is um, one of those things. So anyway, um, uh, shall, we, shall we stop? Uh, okay, okay, so, okay, okay. It's good that while he's uh, out, we can do a lot of these jokes and a lot of these controversial things, you know? Yeah, so just to wait until he goes. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, one thing, <clears throat> each of these four Imams, they have something unique about their school of thought. Okay? So, for example, as Maliki, uh, uh, as Maliki follower, uh, so what you can suggest the superiority of Imam Malik above the rest of the Imams? Uh, okay, okay. So we have in his school something called the practice of Ahlul Madina. It is derived from the habits of Rasulullah. That is something unique about his school of thought. And what about Ahmad ibn Hanbal? Narrations, narrations, narrations. That is unique thing. You don't find that in Hanafi school. Okay. What about Shafi? In the time of Imam Shafi, there was big, uh, you can say, um, uh, two main streams: narrative and rational. Imam Shafi is the first person to try to bring them together. That is unique thing about Imam Shafi and his school. And what about the Hanafi school of thought? So, <clears throat> Abu Hanifa, in my own understanding, after studying his school, is he is scholar, but also he is layman. Do you understand? So he is one of us. Isn't it that? So, for example, Imam Malik, radiallahu anhu, he was very well known for narrating the hadith, Muatta. And mainly, he would be going to the mosque, and back home, teaching, looking after the students. Okay? Same thing about Imam Shafi, teaching, writing books, you know, mainly engaged into the academia. Same thing about uh, Ahmad ibn Hanbal. So that's why they have, each of them, including Imam Malik, they have produced volumes of works by their hands, you know? Okay, so for example, about Muatta, what was the number of the narrations in Muatta initially? Initially, it was over, it's close to seven, uh, over 7,000 narrations. That is a lot. Okay, but right now we have something about between 700 to 800. Okay, so anyway. And what about the uniqueness about, about Abu Hanifa? So his uniqueness is he used to be, he used to participate our lifestyle. Just buying and selling. He's just merchant in the uh, Sadr Bazaar, you know. So in the like a market, traditional market, he has a shop. Okay. And did any of you guys, did you have a chance of working in the traditional market? Any of you? If you want to learn about anything before BBC produces on newspaper, the news will be raised first in the market. And then it will be spread on TV and newspapers. So everything about concerning the city, it will be in the traditional market. So Abu Hanifa was one of us. Okay. So um, I do respect the rest of the schools of thought, but it is very well known that the most flexible, the most flexible school of thought, it is the Hanafi. Okay. So for example, Shall we mention a few uh, controversial issues? Yeah? Yeah, because without that, it's not uh, everyone is asleep, you know? So let's provoke that thing, you know? Okay, so for example, um, uh, we have something to do with the custom. Custom means culture. Okay? So Abu Hanifa says, as long as there is no oppression, you should leave the people practicing their cultures. Do you understand? It makes our life easy, a lot. Am I right? 
Okay, so for example, we have our social culture. Okay, our, you can say private, individual, the, so certain customs related to the families or relatives, etc. Okay, so Abu Hanifa says, leave them doing whatever they want according to their culture as long as there is no oppression in it. But as soon as there will be oppression, fiqh, uh, Islamic uh, theology goes in and says, now you should not do it. You should stop it. So the concept of custom, it is first, it was, uh, you can say, established by Imam Abu Hanifa. Okay, so I think it is as a fruit of living inside of the people. Okay, so buying and selling in the market as well as going for like a trips uh, with the caravans to buy and sell, etc. So all of that will put the scholar inside of the issues which concerns the individual as, as well as the society. Okay, so that made, uh, that is one of the unique things about the Hanafi school of thought. So, but as I mentioned, each school, they have their own certain unique aspects. Okay, so now, um, what else we can say about him, Abu Hanifa? You know, um, <clears throat> unfortunately, during his lifetime, the um, political, the political field, it was not uh, quite calm. Okay, so there was two main political, you can say, groups fighting with one another. And somehow Abu Hanifa, as well as the rest of the scholars, they were involved. Uh, who knows, who are these two political schools? Which schools? No, no, political. No theological. Uh, Bani Umayya and... And the second is Bani Abbas. It is purely political movements, okay, and there was a lot of bloodshed between them. Okay, so in, during that time, we lost uh, a lot of top scholars, okay, Said bin Jubair and many, many others, okay, so, um, and somehow um, Abu Hanif was involved into it. Um, he was, for some reason, supporting Banu Abbas. So if you have heard that he has been jailed, so that was the actual reason. Okay, so Banu Umayyah found out that uh, Abu Hanifa was supporting the Abbasi, the Abbasi movement. Okay, um, you know, th this po uh, political uh, movement is very difficult to know if it is right or wrong. Okay, but in my own understanding, um, the involvement of Abu Hanifa in that uh, battle, it was not because of the political reason, but because of something else. Okay, so it's quite difficult to, to know because it does not fit into his way of thinking. So anyway, uh, Banu Umayya, they have jailed him. Okay, so, and then there was attempt of killing Imam Abu Hanifa for supporting the uh, Abbasi uh, movement. Okay, Abbasi uh, political movement. Uh, anyway, um, and then um, uh, it was in the same time, actually, Imam Malik was also taken. Okay, just um, when uh, uh, Abu Jafar al-Mansur invaded, into Medina, if you remember, Imam Malik was also. Uh, did you study the biography of Imam Malik? Oh, okay, so I, I'm not really sure. After two weeks, I think you should come to deliver a lecture about him because I'm not coming again. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so that is one of the uh, quite uh, painful, uh, uh, you can say, uh, <clears throat> periods in the biography of uh, Imam Abu Hanifa. Um, besides that, um, there was this um, uh, issue uh, during the life of Imam Abu Hanifa. Some uh, people started claiming to be prophets. Who remembers? Uh, if you can just give me only one name. Oh, it was just before him, wasn't it? During the time of Abu Hanifa. Okay, so anyway, uh, we have this verse in Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ مِنْ بَعْدِ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدِ Okay, saying, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam, predicting a prophet after him, okay, whose name will be Ahmad. So there are many people 
even during the time of uh, Abu Hanif, and actually one was recent, wasn't he? I think he was from Russia, actually. Who, yeah, yeah, it's just, it's still ongoing. Yeah, so uh, his name was Ahmad and claiming to be prophet. Okay, so anyway, um, <clears throat> okay, so, <clears throat> I'm not really sure if we should go into these details about this false prophet because he's going to... Now I think we should stop about uh, controversial things. It's okay if we can just stop for the Maghrib, please. Yeah, so inshallah we'll carry on after that. Thank you very much. Uh, to see the face of this guy from BMTV, Sheikh Atabi Shukur. So that was the reason for the people to come here. So we'll just make our lectures based on that. <clears throat> uh, you know, <clears throat> so obviously um, there is very uh, important thing which creates the glorious personalities. Okay, so through the biography, inshallah, we're going to just work out what make this scholar Abu Hanifa to be that famous and glorious scholar. Now, uh, I'm quite confident that uh, you studied this uh, leadership course. Did, did you study or not? Because in the university, I think in most of the faculties in the first year, they go through this leadership uh, uh, course, isn't it? What makes the person to be successful? Can you list only four qualities? Besides, you know, playing that PlayStation, is it fourth generation now? So that is one of the qualities of the leader. Give me four. Yes. You were saying? Yes, someone was saying that. So four qualities. Sorry? Organizing. So he should have organizing qualities. Organizing, okay, mashallah, good. Yeah, so organizing his time, organizing his commitments, isn't it? Mashallah, now you have summarized everything, actually. I wanted that in detail, but you have spoiled my thing, you know. Yeah, so please give me four in detail. He summarized everything in one, definitely. Organizing or being organized, it includes everything. But in detail, if you can just break it down into the details, please. But mashallah, how old are you? Mashallah, good. Is it you made up by yourself or you, you read somewhere? By, by yourself. Mashallah, good. Good one. Yes, Sadie, yes. So, four things. We'll try to, we'll try to look into the biography of Abu Hanifa now to find these four qualities. Patient, sober. That's the fundamental first. Yes. Second. Dedicated. Definitely. You have to be dedicated to what you are uh, trying to achieve. Excellent. So that's the second quality. And third is. Uh, you should have very deep analyzing skills. Without analyzing, you never can succeed. Let's suppose that you try to make a project. For example, you are doing IT, so you are applying for a job, and you have been rejected. So without analyzing, if you go to apply for a second time, it will be again just like gambling, you know? But if you analyze what was the wrong thing and maybe the, the error was in your application or maybe in how you look like. So without analyzing, you never can succeed. Okay, so that is the third one. And fourth one, give me the last one, please. Excellent. Learning skills. These four are one of the most, obviously they normally mention about eight or nine, but these four are included in any. Okay, so if you have that four, definitely, inshallah, you are going to have great uh, future. Now, we, uh, I'm going to mention a few 
stories about Imam Abu Hanifa just will, and then based on that we'll try to work out his personality. Okay. Abu Yusuf says, Abu Yusuf says, I was an orphan child. Okay. And I had sisters and mother and I was responsible to look after them. And then he was shepherd, Abu Yusuf. He is one of the top students of Imam Abu Hanifa. And then he says, once Abu Hanifa saw me, okay, and most likely it is maybe in the mosque or wherever. And then he asked me, what do you do? I have explained, etc. So then he said, come and attend my lessons. So Abu Yusuf says, I started attending uh, the, the lessons. And, um, uh, but then it uh, made me to stop working as much as I used to. So my income dropped very rapidly. And once my mother came and started insulting Abu Hanifa in the lecture, during the lecture, my mother came and started insulting, shouting at Abu Hanifa, saying, what are you doing? You are spoiling my son. He looks after me and after his sisters. And now because of you, he's not working. So our income is very low. So we are, we are all the time hungry. Okay, so then Abu Hanifa said, um, you are not understanding because he will be great scholar in the future. And then Abu Yusuf says, since then Abu Hanifa started maintaining me. Okay, so maintaining me and maintaining my entire family. So he says, whatever I used to gain from working as a shepherd, so Abu Hanifa started giving me twice or three times more than that. Until I, I spent with him, with him, with Abu Hanifa, 22 years, and then um, after 22 years, I have remembered the prediction of Imam Abu Hanifa about my future. Okay, now, um, uh, now can anyone please help me based on this story to analyze the personality of Imam Abu Hanifa? So, for example, let's be realistic. Now I'm just teaching you guys. Someone just enters, some lady enters, you know. And then starts shouting at me, you are spoiling my child, he's supposed to be studying, he's doing IT, and you are stopping him from that, etc. And then what's supposed to be my reaction to that? And what Abu Hanifa did to that? So can, can you comment on this story, please? Anyone? Anything. You know... When you are insulted by someone, feeding them, you have to be very, very generous and very noble person. Because is it, um, let, let's be honest, um, the one who has been insulted or humiliated in front of a people by someone within the last one year, can you put up your hand? Was you able to favor him after that? Or do you feel pain after that? You feel pain, isn't it? That's natural, natural reaction of each of us. But for some reason, Abu Hanifa did not, he just ignored that, but on top of that, he started feeding the entire family for the next 22 years. That is scary, that is really scary. What type of glorious personality you should be you are humiliated and insulted by this person, and then you maintain them. That is definitely, by looking this character, you know that you are not in front of just normal person, extraordinary, extraordinary person. So you are in front of some special person. Yeah, okay. Yes, Sadie. Can can you can you find out in this story? Yes. Okay. So how? Yes. And what about learning the fourth quality in this story? 
Um, of course, but that was not within the same, yeah, maybe 22 years. Uh, okay, so maybe I would just say learning is when someone is shouting and insulting you, normally you do not learn. You do not learn what is actually the story, isn't it? But you react emotionally and you also insult. So the learning skills, it is the most extreme example maybe. While you're being insulted, learning the the actual point. Because after that he started maintaining. Why did he maintain? Because he did learn while being insulted. So if you have this skill of learning in the most extreme situations, that is what we are looking for actually. Excellent, thank you. Jazakumullah khairan. Now, you know, unfortunately now we are uh, somehow most of us or maybe all of us, we became quite shallow thinking people. Okay, so that's why me, each of us, we get uh, a lot of pain in our lives because we, when some story is told to us, we do not learn from it. So let's suppose that you have been um, uh, backstabbed by your friend within the last couple of weeks, for example. Believe me, before you have got that pain, you had plenty of stories through which you could work out that this guy is going to backstab you. Am I right? So learning, learning and analyzing skills, you know. Obviously, there will be many situations in which it will be out of your control, but yet you can avoid quite a lot of betrayals if you have this learning and analyzing skills. Okay, so anyway, that is one story. And then uh, another story, um, uh, people, uh, women used to speak a lot about Abu Hanifa. <laughs> okay, not, not that controversial thing, you know, just to, uh, just to comment now. <laughs> yeah, so obviously Abu Hanifa was quite a handsome person. Okay, um, yeah, so now I think the fashionable, um, uh, skin color is bright one, but that was not the case all the time. Dark skin was actually very wanted, so Abu Hanifa was very dark skinned and he had a big beard yeah so i'm not going to comment you know <laughs> on that one because it's controversial you know yeah um he was persian looking persian looking tall and slim okay and uh, another thing um uh, we spoke about it in uh, quite a few of our lectures we have in islam we have two types of scholars some of them they uh in they're inclined inclined more more toward the ascetic way of living do you know, eating just little and wearing the most, you know, cheapest clothes. You understand that type of ascetic style. And the second category, they are Porsche. So Abu Hanifa used to be the second category. Okay. Uh, they say, they mention this story in which someone came to Abu Hanifa saying that I want you to help me in my problem. So Abu Hanifa is supposed to be going and sorting out his problem. Okay. And it was wealthy person. The person who was, so then he said, okay, in that case, let's change the cloth. Give me your coat. Okay. And then uh, Abu Hanifa went to the government and he sorted out the problem. So when he came back, Abu Hanifa said to that person, you made me to feel ashamed because I was wearing your clothes in front of the officials. Okay. And then that person was shocked. What are you talking about? I bought my coat for four golden coins and then he says but then i thought and then i looked at his coat and it was for 35 golden coins you know so it's a very expensive coat okay so how would uh, if we if we want to compare that way of clothing to contemporary uh, contemporary you can say way of clothing so what it would be like a chanel or something versace like isn't there like a makeup, like a red makeup. Because expensive, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, um, because the uh, understanding of Abu Hanifa was, he used to say, uh, if Allah granted you luxurious life, so that is grant of Allah. So Allah loves to see the effect of his grants on his slaves. Do you understand? Okay, and he used to say, there is no any grant higher than knowledge. So you have to express the gratitude by wearing it. Okay, so that is uh, one. So anyway, 
So women used to uh, speak about, so anyway, once he was uh, working with his student, okay, so a couple of students, so um, they were just working, and then women started whispering one to another. You see, so everyone in here started uh, smiling. No, no, they did not whisper about that, you know. Do you know what did they whisper about? <laughs> you know, they said, this is the guy who never sleeps at night, all the time prays. Abu Hanifa said, I thank God that he did not make the people to speak about me something that I do not do. So he actually used to spend long nights praying and reciting. Okay, you know, um, one of the qualities of spiritual leader that your connection with God should be very close. Okay, so it's not only just five times as I did here, very quickly, two minutes is not that, but long connection, very deep connection. Okay, so um, do you remember, so for example, Imam Ali, radiallahu who mentions the story of Badr. Okay, in which uh, Imam Ali says, it was in the trip, in the journey. Imam Ali says, everyone was asleep except Rasulullah sallallahu was wasallam was praying just underneath, next to the palm tree, palm tree, um, praying, crying, and asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until Bilal woke up for Salat al-Fajr. Do, have you seen this movie called uh, Passions of Jesus. Obviously, I'm Sheikh, so I do not watch movies. I, I saw it through meditation, you know. So don't think that I do go to the cinema, you know. So take, don't get me wrong. So th- understand, because I'm Sheikh, you know. So in the right beginning of the movie, if you have seen, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam under, underneath of the palm tree. That, that bit is actually borrowed from Rasulullah alayhi salatu. I do not say that Isa was not like that. But that exact episode was taken from Rasulullah. Have you seen? Just go and watch the right beginning. Okay. So anyway, uh, so um, uh, Abu Hanifa was one of those spiritual people, very deeply involved with God. You know, what is the spiritual strength of the believer? It's one thing, isn't it? Obviously, it is dhikr, but give me the exact description of the available one. Allah says, Inna nashi'at al-layli hiya ashaddu wat'an wa aqwa muqila. Do you know the prayers or the connection that we do at night? That is the most grounding and most straightening also. Okay? Aqwa means making the person straight. Qila means in terms of your analyzing, your speaking, your way of behaving will be very straight. Okay? Ashaddu wat an, very deeply grounding. Okay? Obviously, what we do here, it cannot be called as nashi'atul layl except linguistically. But actual nashi'atul layl, it means that you try to reconnect to God, but deeply, by concentration. So it's not that uh, praying quickly, uh, just to carry on with the lecture. It's not that, but deeply. Okay? Once this, um, um, uh, one of the scholars, okay, so he's very uh, well-known, a uh, judge, Qadi. So anyway, he says, once I, at night, I came to the mosque of Kufa, and so someone reciting in very beautiful voice. I tried to listen to him, and his voice was very beautiful, beautiful recitation. And then I thought, after him completing, completing half Jews, you know the Jews, like uh, 10 pages of Quran, I thought now he will go for the ruku, but he did not go. He completed one Jews. I thought now he will do. And he carried on for seven Jews. It is 140 pages of Quran. Then he went for the ruku. And after that, when it became brighter, so I saw and it was Abu Hanifa standing and praying. So at night, very, you can say, deeply involved with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
Okay. Um, can we just, uh, because we don't want the biography of such a glorious person to be just as storytelling, can we please just um, take some practical, you can say, uh, information? Can we tonight or tomorrow try to experiment this? Because Allah does not lie. Maybe it's our understanding is incorrect. But if what we understood is correct, so that what should happen. So the reconnection to God at night, okay, I should do what on. It's more grounding the person. During the night, but during the day, it will make you more straight. I mean, uh, so your acts with the people will be more, uh, so th- there will be less errors. Do you understand? And the things that you say, it will be straighter, more correct, more wiser. Because sometimes it happens, you say some things during the day, and then you will be sorry for the entire night. Yeah, w- when you think back about it, you will be sorry. So Allah says, Nashi'atul Layl avoids that. The reconnection to God at night makes, make, it protects you from incorrect behavior. Do you understand? Incorrect behavior in terms of a verbal behavior or actual, you can say practical behavior. Okay? And our Mashaikh say that Allah in here is talking about tahajjud. Okay? So only just make it two rakat, but make it actually you are reconnecting to God. It's not that you are praying, like making movements, but you are actually getting connected to God. Okay? Just for our information, some people, they get reconnect to God, they will get reconnected to God by long prayers. Because they are a bit slower, so they need a bit of time to focus on it. But sometimes they lose concentration if they pray for a long period. So they need for shorter. So you are also one of these two. So work out what you are and try it. Because as you see, um, if you have heard, they say that Abu Hanifa prayed the uh, Fajr namaz by the wudu that he performed for Isha for 40 days, for 40 years. Have you heard about it? So the entire night spending to get reconnected to God. You understand? Okay, so you just try it tonight or maybe tomorrow. And let's see how it affects on us. Okay, so it's very possible that this was the secret of Abu Hanifa, which made him to that glorious person. Because it's not that there will be uh, thousands of uh, factors to, to, do one, to give one effect. But there, there will be one main factor, isn't it? And there are few supportive. Maybe that was his main secret of you can say, uh, progress and uh, success in his life. Okay, so anyway, so coming back, um, uh, and there is another very beautiful quality in this person. Um, so I will mention the story you guys try to work out. Uh, so if you remember that uh, incident when he was taken to the jail because of some certain political reasons, so they kept him for 10 days. For 10 days. Okay. And later, later, his son and his grandson, his grandson, his name is Ismail. His son is Hamad. Do I have Hamad or Ismail here? Or Hamada, Ismaila? No? Okay. So anyway, so his son and his grandson, they were just walking. And then, uh, uh, for some reason, Hamad cried. And then his son said, Father, why are you crying? So he said, I remembered my father. They were lashing him exactly just next to this tree. Okay, so it was within 10 days. Every day in the morning, they were lashing him for like 10 lashes. Until the last day, Abu Hanifa cried. And in that time, Abu Hanifa was was not a young boy. So he was about 45, 50 years old man. So can you imagine that 45 years old man cries only for being lashed for 10 times. You do not expect, expect, isn't it? So later, his students asked him about that. So he said, because I saw among the people who were attending the lashing, I saw my, my mother. So I cried because of that. Okay. Now, can we try to sense the spirit of Abu Hanifa in this story? What do you see in here? Yes, definitely. 
because um, governors, they were forcing him to do something for them. But he said, no, definitely that is sabr. Even when publicly being lashed, yet insisting to have sabr, definitely that is glorious point, yes, in, in, in the character. Yes, this connection is very rarely could be found even in our time. We are very close to our mothers in our childhood, isn't it? But a person at the age of 45 or 50 cries because he sees that his mother is in pain by seeing him. In our time, at the age of 45, people become very like tough, isn't it? Tough-hearted, rock-hearted, you know, towards their mothers and fathers rarely visiting them or even on the phone like speaking to them as in very rude way that is very beautiful thing you know in his biography there are three four stories i read it a lot this is one of them because it is just human we sense that he's not a scholar but he's a human human heart isn't it crying for your mother can you put your hand up if any of you guys cry for your mother no, I, I do believe that uh, women, they are quite soft-hearted, aren't they? Uh, but from, from this side, three. Okay. I hope that it was the real one, you know? Because I also do this, you know, but inside I know what is this, you know? Obviously, women, they are soft-hearted, but I'm talking about this side mainly. We lose our connection with our mothers as soon as we become mature, university, after that marriage, you know, like a friends, party, etc. Isn't that? We get very far. Um, when was it that you have visited your mother? So three brothers who raised their hands. Sadie, when did you visit your mother last time? <laughs> okay. Yes, also, third one. Hmm. Okay. It's, um, yeah, so um, that connection, the connection uh, with our mothers, it's only humans have that connection, you know, with a real human heart. And also the animals have it. But the humans with satanic heart, they don't have that connection, you know, very dry towards their mothers. Abu Hanifa, you know, merchant, multimillionaire merchant who wears a co coat for 35 golden coins. The wealthiest people in our time, they, they don't have heart. I mean, a lot of them, they don't have heart. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? They have like ice in there. But this guy, very wealthy, very popular, okay, very knowledgeable, but yet uh, acts with his mother like that by crying. Well, that is out of this world, you know. That is a beautiful thing. Yeah, so maybe in the entire biography of Abu Hanifa, he made quite a lot of bright things, but maybe this is the brightest one. Like a human heart, you know, human heart. That is beautiful. That was very beautiful, you know. And there is another story, again, because we're talking about the mother of Abu Hanifa. This is funny, by, by the way, joke. Um, and, but it really happened. In the time of uh, Abu Hanifa, there was this Imam, Khutayb. Okay, as far as I remember, his name was Abu Zaid something. Abu Zaid Kufi or Abu Zaid something like that. Khutayb. Because you know the difference between the uh, orators, Khutayb's, and the scholars. People think that orators have more knowledge. Then the scholars, am I right? Okay, oh, just compare in your brain two famous, I'm not going to mention anyone's name. One has knowledge and the second is very orator. So orators are more popular, aren't they? Yeah, so we had the same story in the time of Abu Hanifa. Obviously, no one equals the knowledge of Abu Hanifa, but he was not popular in his time. He had very handful number of students. But the Khutib of the central mosque of Kufa, he was very popular. But Khutib, do you know the orators? They know the scholars, don't they? 
Yeah. So uh, the mother of Abu Hanifa used to say, okay, son, I have some question about my wudu and namaz. Can you take me to the khatib? So I want to ask, ask him. Okay, so, and then Abu Hanif used to, well, what you can say, you know, your mother is telling you to do something. You cannot say, I'm a scholar, you know. For your mother, you are that child, you know, breastfeeding child. And Imam Abu Hanif, so anyway, he used to just take him to this Abu Zaid guy, Khatib. And then Abu Zaid knows who Abu Hanif is, you know. So Abu Hanif used to say, my mother wants to know the answer for X, Y, Z. In the story, it says, Abu Zaid used to feel ashamed and saying, what do you think, oh, Imam, by yourself? Abu Hanif, what do you think by yourself? And he would give the same answer to his mother, you know. So that was, um, that was quite uh, a strange story, you know. Um, it happens quite, uh, quite a lot, you know. So, for example, some of you guys could be expert of IT, but your mother does not believe in it, you know. Your mother thinks that that other guy on TV is more higher in terms of expertise in IT. Okay, so we remain uh, children for our mothers. Yeah, so anyway, <clears throat> okay, so let's analyze another story uh, about Abu Hanifa. It's very uh, dangerous, but very important for us because we are now starting our life. We're in the university, so when we go out to start our life, we are going to need this a lot. There was Abu Hanifa actually during his lifetime, he evolved once big time. So in his early times, he was uh, on the way of uh, the Fuqaha, the scholars of Kufa. But after that, he evolved. Because when you live and you, when you start comparing your knowledge to the real world, so you understand that, that quite a lot of it is weak and fake. Then, if you are genuine, you evolve, you walk out, you grow out of that, you can say, level. That's what exactly happened to Imam Abu Hanifa. But unfortunately, when he has evolved, people, especially scholars, they started criticizing him really big time. And the words, the criticism, which they were saying, it was quite painful. But one thing, okay, one thing, um, so two stories. Okay, one of them. <clears throat> so one of them. <clears throat> um, someone came to uh, Sufyan al-Thawri. Sufyan al-Thawri, we know him, one of the top scholars of Kufa. S he said, oh Sufyan, it is such strange incident that I hear all of the scholars of Kufa backbiting Abu Hanifa, but I attend the classes of Abu Hanifa, I have never heard him saying a single word about any of them. Sufyan Thori responded saying, because Abu Hanifa is much more brainier, he's much more wiser than to spread away his good deeds to his enemies. Did you get the, the moral of the story? It's very important for us. Okay, so the moral of the story is, um, we are all go, we, we will face each of us. No one is exemption. Everyone in our life, we are going to go through a period, temporary. Believe me, it's very short, temporary, but unavoidable. Okay, it will happen to each of us in which people will stone us. Do you understand? Okay, so sometimes it will be very painful and then you speak back. As you see, Abu Hanifa did not do it. So he went through that dark period of his life in high nobility. He never said any ill word about anyone. Zufar, one of his students, says, I have never seen anyone who said any ill words against his enemies who did not say anything except Abu Hanifa. I saw him only once. And what was that? So normally he would not react. He would not feel hurt, you know, by the uh, backbiting slanders of the people. But once he came back, he was invited to the congregation. And most likely scholars started, you know, they went on him, you know, just, you are this, every, from every side, you know. Okay, so Abu Hanifa did not respond, and then he came back, and then Zufar says, I saw him, he was sat 
in, in the mosque. Okay, his students were there, but he was very silent, dark but silent. Do you know sometimes uh, when you are happy, you are very bright, do you see? But sometimes when you are very hurt, like darkness, you, like you look at the person and you, you sense it. So Zufar says he was dark and silent, and then he said, he said only one word, okay? So he said, <clears throat> what is, if, what would be if I would not exist for them? Finish. That was only his reaction to that. Is it backbiting or is it, it's just nothing, isn't it? Yeah, so in my own understanding, this uh, Abu Hanifa had big heart. But it came after that incident because he was in, invited to the congregation and all of the scholars went on him really badly. So I think he was deeply hurt. So that was his reaction only. That little comment. That little comment. You know, I think it is a good thing for each of us to learn. Okay, some of us will go through that period multiple times. But there will not be anyone who will not face that period. And I do assume that some of the brothers and sisters, they already had a couple of times this type of periods, isn't it? But believe me, it will not be for longer than three years. Never longer than three years. That dark period in our life when people will start stoning. Because people get bored, you know. Some, something new will come and people will get involved into their own things. They will leave you alone. So only just crossing that period, maximum of three years. And then how often? It depends on how high you are. If you are very high, so that will be quite a regular thing for you. But if you are not as high, high means um, very wealthy, um, very handsome, for example, as myself, you know, or very ugly as you guys, you know, or for example, very, um, skillful. Do you understand? So something unique means you will get this, um, uh, regularly in your life. But believe me, it's very short. So if it is regular, so very short. But if it is one off, so then long one. Okay. Very long one. So it is the nature of a human being. Okay, so uh, that is uh, another aspect of the character of this glorious person, Abu Hanifa. Okay, um, another thing, um, another thing uh, about uh, uh, about Imam Abu Hanifa is um, <clears throat> so. Just going back to that uh, dark side, you can say in the biography of Abu Hanifa. So he was jailed. Twice. First time, Banu Umayyah, Ibn Hubayr is very well known person. Uh, Banu Umayyah, they jailed him. And the second time, Banu Abbas jailed him. But he was executed by ban Banu Abbas. They have poisoned him. Okay, so because, um, uh, he, uh, so because Banu Abbas, they wanted to do quite few oppressive things. And Abu Hanifa stood up against that. So Banu Abbas disliked that. Okay, and as you know, in that in that time, uh, people who would speak out the truth, government, they would not uh, show them any mercy. Okay, yeah. So Alhamdulillah, for example, we are living in the West, especially in some of the Eastern countries. Till today, they do have this: you are not allowed to speak. Okay, yeah. So anyway, so he made a couple of comments which was disliked by the Abbasi uh, kings. So he has been jailed. Okay, um, Zufar says, um, Imam Zufar says, one of his students, um, <clears throat> when he started speaking out, when he became vocal, once I went to him and then I said to him, oh Abu Hanifa, if you do not stop it, they are going to take you and they will not leave us alone also. Zufar I don't know how the intuition of this guy is very scary, Zufar. And that's how exactly happened. They took him and they, they just finished off. They have ruined the genuine students of Abu Hanifa. And the other people came to take the place, you know, actors pretending to be the students of Abu Hanifa. You understand? But what Zufar said came letter by letter, literally it came true. 
Okay, so Imam Zufar said to Abu Hanifa saying, when he, uh, Zufar says, when Abu Hanifa became vocal, I went to him and then I said, oh Abu Hanifa, if you do not slow down, they are going to take you, but they are not going to leave us alone either. Okay, then he says, but next day, next day, so Zufar went to uh, say the story to his student, Abu Nuaim. And then Abu Nuaim wanted to go back next day to speak with Abu Hanifa again, just to calm him down. So um, Abu Nuaim says, I went to his house, but when I went, they already came and he was already taken. And I could see that he was quite down. Abu Hanifa was quite down. So they took him from Kufa to Baghdad, where he was killed. Okay, and obviously, uh, in that time, politicians used to play quite a lot. Okay, so they made up a story saying that uh, we did not kill him, we just set him free, but on the way, highway robbers killed him. <laughs> that was the official comment from uh, Banu Abbas. But actually, it came later, the son of Abu Hanifa confirmed that he has been poisoned in the, in the jail. So we went to take his body from there. Okay, one last story about his related to his death. Um, so before his death, before um, a couple of uh, couple of months, they brought um, uh, twelve twelve thousand silver coins to Abu Hanifa as a gift, as you can say, a gift from the government. So in my own understanding, most likely it was just uh, to build up a connection. Okay. So he's one of his students says, I have never seen Abu, ha- Abu Hanifa. Naturally, he was quite silent person. Okay. Uh, introvert. Okay. But in that day, he did not say a word. He just turned his back to, to us and he was just said that. That person came and then he just, uh, um, dropped the, the gift. 12,000 silver coin. That's a lot of money actually. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> Um, before Abu Hanifa was taken, okay, so most likely Abu Hanifa knew that he's going to be killed. Then he said a will. He made a will to his son Hamad saying, after my death, just pick up that 12,000 uh, uh, silver coins and take it back to the same person who brought it saying that, uh, my father, you left your Amana with my father to look after. So now my father is dead. Now I'm just returning it back to you. Abu Hanifa did not even touch that. Yeah, so it is, for me, some type of karama, you know, how Abu Hanifa made these things, etc. So it was quite a miraculous thing for me. So anyway, um, I think, inshallah, that much should be enough, inshallah, for today. Yeah, and um, thank you very much, Zakumullah Khairan. But uh, as I said, next week is going to be Shafi'i, so I'm not related to Imam Shafi'i, so I'm not coming. These two, is he also Shafi'i? Yeah. No, Salafi. Salafi, ah, okay, okay. So Shafi'i, Maliki, and then Hanbali, so then Salafi school of thought will be taught after all four. Yeah, so I'm not coming for the... Shafi'i, Imam Shafi'i's biography. Okay, so anyway, the moral, the moral of the story. So Alhamdulillah, we have learned quite few things, okay, quite few things about the biography of such great Imam. Okay, so let's try to take something for ourselves. Okay, so I took for myself, for myself, I took that. Today I'm going to try this Nashi'atul Layl. Nashi'atul Layl. Okay. Our mashayikh who taught us tafsir, they used to tell us to do this. When they would see that one of the students started going left and right while speaking or behavior became a bit strange, so they used to advise for nashi'atul layl. It will straighten. Well grounded, deeply grounded and straightening the behavior and the way of speaking. Okay, so... Uh, that is about that. And thank you very much. Jazakumullah khairan